This case takes place in Stockholm, Sweden on the 2nd of August 2018. Erik Torrell was raised in the suburb of Vasatan in Sweden. He was described as a kind and gentle man who loved his family. Eric also had Down syndrome, a chromosomal condition that impacts physical and intellectual development. At 20 years old, Eric had the developmental age of a 3 year old. He couldn't speak due to an additional diagnosis of autism, and the only word he could say was mum. His mother would later comment, Eric had no understanding of danger. His starting point was that everyone was kind. Because of his conditions, Eric spent his time at home under the watchful supervision of his parents. But on Wednesday, the 1st of August, he decided to go out and play on his own. It was in the middle of the night when Eric snuck out of the front door. He wasn't supposed to go anywhere by himself, but there had been a number of occasions where he managed to get out of his house and onto the street without anybody noticing. Before he left, Eric picked up a toy gun from his pile of toys. In the early hours of the next morning, Eric's mother woke up and realised that he had left the house. She immediately woke up her husband and they called the police to report their son missing and to give them information about Eric's appearance and his mental capacity. As soon as she hung up the phone, the couple got dressed and headed out onto the streets to search for Eric. Due to Eric's condition, he couldn't walk too far, so they assumed that they would find him pretty quickly. But tragically, this wouldn't be the case. At around 4am the next morning, three police officers in the district were called to a disturbance inside a residential courtyard. Residents had reported that a man was waving a gun around and behaving in a threatening manner. When the officers arrived, they yelled at the man to put down his weapon. They received no reply, so they tried again, but still there was no response from the man. It was of course, Eric. The police began firing, but they didn't just fire one or two shots. Round after round was fired into Eric. In total, more than 25 shots were fired towards Eric. Witnesses would later report, that it was like a hail fire of bullets. At 5.45am on the Thursday morning, Eric was pronounced dead at the scene. Eric's shooting prompted an outcry in Sweden. Vigils and memorials were held all across the country and many citizens called for a review on the use of deadly force in policing. Sweden has a population of around 10 million people, and in the past 20 years, on average, one person a year has been shot to death by the police. But in 2018, that number jumped to six people. Compare that to the UK, which has six times the population, and yet only four to six deaths per year as a result of a police shooting. As the story picked up speed in the media, the officers involved in the shooting were reported to have justified their actions by saying that Eric was behaving in a threatening manner. They claimed that he was a danger to others and that he was non-responsive to their demands. But Eric's mother, Katarina, dismissed their statements. She claimed that the police would have been able to tell that Eric had Down syndrome and that there was no way they could mistake him as a threat. She said, he wasn't capable of being threatening. The only thing he could do was hug and kiss. He was the kindest and most peaceful teddy bear in the world. There was a problem with the statements taken from the police. Local media reports stated that the officers had shot Eric three times in the stomach, but the stories didn't match up with the evidence. Eric had undergone an autopsy after his death, and they found that he had been shot three times, but that two of the shots had hit Eric in the back. The location of the gunshot wounds is a significant factor in this case. If what the officers said was true, and the reason they shot Eric was because he was a threat, then surely they would have shot him from the front. To shoot him in the back means he was facing away from them at some point during the incident. In fact, one of these bullets in the back was the fatal wound, which means he was alive when he turned around. The evidence pointed to the fact that the officers had been misleading in their statements, which means there was doubt about whether the shooting was justified at all. 
Officials who reviewed the shooting agree that there were enough questions to justify taking a closer look, and the Swedish police authority opened an investigation. The officers involved were immediately stood down, whilst the circumstances surrounding the shooting were looked at more closely. Ultimately, the investigation concluded that the police were justified in opening fire on Eric. There was no way for them to know that the gun was not real, or that Eric's developmental challenges were a factor. Add to this the fact that their training dictated that they must neutralize the threat in the most effective way possible. In other words, shoot to kill. A Swedish officer told reporters, We have learned to be offensive. Forward, forward until the perpetrator can no longer hurt others. If that means he needs to be shot to death, then so be it. It is also important to note the type of ammunition used by the Swedish police. The bullets expand on impact. This causes immediate and severe injuries, which are intended to stop the target instantly. The report also determined that the officers should have stopped shooting Eric when he turned away from them, as at this point he was only a minimal threat and there was no reason to continue firing at him. If they had stopped at that point, Eric may not have even died. The author of the report commented, I have decided that the police did not follow procedures that they should have done, and, had they done so, they would have realized that Eric, the victim, was not a threat. Because of this investigation, two of the officers involved in the shooting were later charged with negligence and misconduct, and a third was charged with causing another person's death. Other officers present during the shooting were not charged. During the trial, the officers provided more context about what happened in the early hours of that day. They stated that when they first saw Eric, they believed that he was a wanted suspect who had violently attacked his partner and threatened to kill her. They didn't know that the actual suspect had already been arrested and was locked up, as the information about his arrest was not recorded on their police computers. So when they turned up and saw Eric holding what they believed to be a gun, they assumed it was him. Only moments before the shooting, the officers had crossed paths with Eric's dad, who was out looking for his son. They spoke briefly, but none of them realized that Eric was the reason the police had been called in the first place. The officers also disputed the evidence about the location and sequence of the shots which killed Eric. In their argument, they stated that there was no way to determine exactly what Eric's position was when he was shot, even though the bullets were in his back. They doubled down on their justification by saying that police make split-second decisions to protect the public, and that is exactly what they were doing. In October of 2019, all three officers were acquitted of the charges against them, and they were allowed to return to their positions. Eric's family disagreed with the verdicts, but they accepted them. Eric's mother described her son as wonderful and the world's most loving person. She said, We are completely destroyed. We are in shock. I can't even believe it's true. Why did they have to kill him? Why not just shoot him in the foot? I hope that we learn the lessons and look ahead to see what must change in order to safeguard all of our children and young people with developmental and intellectual disabilities who are out in the community among us. The case of Eric is a deeply distressing one. Many have pushed for the reforms that prioritize de-escalation and crisis intervention techniques, especially when dealing with people who have disabilities. It is particularly tragic to consider that something as simple as a toy gun was enough to trigger the chain of events that led to his untimely death.